Hello, this is Dr. Flight, and uh, we're going to spend some time thinking about and focusing on designing product mixes and product lines and different strategies used associated with those. To begin with, let's take a look at the Intel processor products that emerged from the late 1990s through the mid-2000s. And so if we look at this very first diagram here, uh, we have price and we have demand. And as one would expect, as price goes up, demand for products generally goes down. And so um, if we look at the Intel processors. Um, if we look at all of their products over this 20 or so years of, or 15 years of, of time, there are four different products that are offered. The Itanium, the Xeon, the Pentium processor, and the Cel Celeron. Um, now, the first products that were launched, the Pentium and then the Xeon, um, the Pentium was an introductory offering for them. They're like an introductory type of a, a product um, that they launched. They followed by a, a better performing um, product, the, Z, the Xeon. And you can kind of see that over here when we look at performance. The Pentium and then the Xeon uh, followed. Um, after which, though, they came back and they offered the Celeron product. So they went from the Pentium, then they bumped the market up to the Xeon, then they came back down and offered the Celeron, which is at a lower price point, more demand because it's at the lower price point, but also at a lower performance level. So a product that's not expected to, um, to do as well, if you will. Um, we think about performance in terms of how it performs um, for, for the marketplace, something like that. Then finally, um, they came back in the mid 2000s and offered the Itanium, which was a better performing product um, at a much higher price. Now, um, these products, this demonstrates that as, um, as products are launched or as a product category evolves, there are different products that are launched um, you know, for different reasons. Um, if you're the market leader, if you're the introducer, if you're the innovator, you can often come into the product into the product market um, with a mid or high level price type of a product. Because initially, you're not going to have a lot of competition. However, at some point during the growth stage, competitors will enter the market, uh, you know, especially if you don't have your channels protected, um, they'll enter the market um, and they'll give you a lot of pressure on price and on, on product quality, and they'll try to take your market share away from you. So as a result, sometimes you have to react, and Intel certainly did with Celeron. The Celeron product is a fighter brand because it's intended to fend off competition that comes in and try to take market share like low-cost low cost imitators uh, might, might try to do. This is an example then of how you can use your products and as you launch your products, um, you think about how they're going to play with each other, but then also how they're going to provide you with a strategic advantage um, in the marketplace. Here's another example of Black & Decker and DeWalt. Black & Decker owns DeWalt. However, they have products side by side in most hardware stores. And so even though they compete with each other, one of the things that we know is that different market segments are um, motivated for different reasons. And so there's a market segment out there in the, in the tool um, you know, trade for lower cost, less, lesser performing products that are at lower price points. And then there's a whole separate market of consumers that would rather pay more and get a better quality, better performing product. So in this case, Black & Decker then has two different market segments that they're really trying to reach, one by their Black & Decker brand and one by their DeWalt brand 
and each brand is positioned very differently to reach each different market segment um, effectively. So here's an example then where we have different uh, level uh, levels of power, if you will, um, for the the hand tools, and then the price. And as the power rating goes up, the price goes up. However, there's a there's a third variable here too. You got price, we have voltage, but then we also have performance criteria as well. So this is a third variable that moderates the relationship between price and voltage. So it and and so and it positively does. So the more performance you can provide given the power and the price um, the better that you'll do. So the, the angle of DeWalt's line here, their curve, is straighter up and it's, it's more up and down. Black and Decker's you know, line here is flatter because they have less performance. You know, they, they, they meet performance less well than DeWalt does. So we actually have a lot of things going on here, but a good illustration of how using your products um, using your products effectively can place you in different market segments. And uh, it's one of the things we think about as we're creating new products, launching them, and so forth. We have another example here with General Electric's appliances. Um, we have a kind of a similar type of a thing where we have a price um, variable here, lower price moving to upper price. So we have the lower price GE Basic. We have mid-level prices, GE Profile and Cafe. And then we have the high price, the GE Monogram. Um, so three different price stages here. Um, and we would expect that the better quality products would have the higher prices. And of course, uh, they, they typically do. Ideally, though, each one of these levels here will reach different market segments. And so we can have completely different products, uh, or we can have completely different product names and product strategies and positioning strategies, but we can have very similar products all within the same company. Um, so this is what we want to think about when we start thinking about um, how we can structure our products and having our product strategy. Um, so um, why do we need a product strategy? Well, a few reasons. First of all, um, product strategies help direct us in a way to go um, strategically for the firm. It talks about, like, if we create a product that's for a specific market, then that directs us towards that market and it helps help us focus a direction for which to go. Product strategy also is used in, in an effort to meet our goals and objectives. So we use a product strategy to grow and to maintain sales and so forth. We also use product strategies defensively and offensively to, um, uh, to compete against um, our direct competitors. Um, so, you know, because we are creating a value proposition, and they are too, and our, what we do product-wise often is impacted um, by how we want to differentiate ourselves. And also, we create product strategies because markets evolve, and we have to add products, and we have to delete products, and we have to change products. And um, so as we look at market changes, we also simultaneously can look at, um, at product strategy changes as well. Again, here's an example of a, of a, of a product array. Um, in a product array, what we want to do is we want to draw out in a chart form um, the different products that a company can offer. And so um, a lot of times we do this in a chart where we have um, the mix, the, the, the product mix is, is the horizontal form here. So the product mix goes across there and the product line typically goes up and down. So we have a horizontal and a vertical component, um, but within here we typically try to um, describe you know, kind of the products that we have. And this is a good visual representation of maybe laying out what a company will offer. 
So the product mix then is the entire range of product lines, and it's typically represented by the horizontal dimension of the product product array. Um, so it may be that a company has multiple product categories or multiple brands that are associated with each product category and each brand would have its own line of products. Also, keep in mind that as we design this, oftentimes each column within the chart represents a distinct operating unit within the company. So this would be a strategic business unit um, within a company. Um, General Motors for years and years and years and years have used multiple strategic business units as independently operated forms of business. So there's the Corvette brand, which is a strategic business unit for GM. Um, there's Chevy. There uh, used to be Saturn. There used to be Oldsmobile. Uh, there used to be a whole bunch of others. Um, there still are, of course, many, many as well. Uh, but each different brand, in this sense, is a strategic business unit. Um, and we can arrange these arrays, these product mix charts, if you will, oftentimes by strategic business units. Um, Federal Express has FedEx Air, FedEx Ground, FedEx City, uh, FedEx, um, I don't know, they have different levels, right, or different distribution methods. Each one could be its own uh, form of um, the chart. Technologies, um, we could be a company that deals with creating um, memory devices. Well, there's CD drives, there's USB drives, there's internal hard drives, there's external hard drives. Um, there are lots of different technologies that go into memory for a computer. Um, and so a company could be designed and organized in a way that reflects that. Of course, we could also um, look at market as well. We could also look at product design too. Um, Caterpillar, um, typically uh, they have three different um, product uh, you know, units or business units, if you will, engines, machines, and parts. They have three different pieces. Um, those three different pieces can behave independent of each other, although they're interrelated. Um, they can certainly operate financially apart from each other if need be. So uh, the, the product mix then um, is something that we want to think about um, from, again, a horizontal perspective. We often think about this from a width perspective. Um, and then we think about how many different product lines might be associated with a particular company, um, and each one being one column in the in, in the chart that we're talking about. Um, one other notion that we want to think about is as we're creating these product array charts and we have columns of products, it's not uncommon for columns or strategic business units to share with each other resources. That's something we'll talk about a little bit more, especially when we look at uh, product platforms. Um, but here's an example with Toyota. Uh, we have the Toyota brand, and now Toyota can act by itself as its own business without worrying about Lexus. Lexus can be its own business, and Scion can be its own strategic business unit as well. Within each one of these brands, they have a series of products. These would be product lines, right? So Toyota introduced Lexus. You know, as a competing, you know, they compete with each other, but again, they're try both trying to reach very different market segments. Um, same with Scion as well. If they were to add another brand somewhere off to the side here, they would be expanding their product mix and creating another strategic business unit uh, by doing so. Keep also in mind that the technology that's used to create vehicles can also be shared across these mix areas. So if, if, if one company has a breakthrough in technology or one unit, has, like Toyota has a breakthrough in technology, 
um, they could share that breakthrough with Lexus. And so both both strategic business units could certainly benefit from that advance. Um, they could also share product lines. They could share uh, relationships with raw, part, raw, raw material um, providers and so on. So synergy and um, shared resources is certainly something to consider when we look across product lines and mixes here. We can also think about, um, again, shared resources with product platforms as well. Here's another example, Tektron's product strategy um, uh, array here by brand. They have helicopters, they own Cessna, they have EasyGo carts, they have, so they have a lot of different brands they own, all associated with small engines or, or recreational vehicles or things along that line. So again, we've got all of these strategic business units uh, that are all within the Tektron family. Um, within this, so just under Cessna, they have additional, they have the Citation sub-brand, the Caravan sub-brand, and then they have single engine products. So we can have brands within brands. We can have self-branded products for sure. Um, so the Cessna Citation, and a Citation is a brand in and of itself. The Caravan, the Sky Skyhawk, or the Sky the sky notation here is something that, that is carried on as well. All right, so the, that's a bit about mixes. We can also think about product lines. So if the mix is associated with the horizontal features of the array, the product line is associated with the vertical features of the array. So what we're talking about here is depth and variety among product offerings within a specific strategic business unit or a specific market segment. So that's the key to think about. We've uh, looked at Procter & Gamble in the past. Procter & Gamble has different products uh, within um, beauty and grooming, health and well-being, and then household. Then within household, we have detergents, cleaners, diapers, and batteries. That's how they are organized. That's the organization of their company through strategic business units or, or, or such. And then within each, each one of these categories, we may have multiple brands as well. So we have Procter & Gamble, but we have these brands, Bold, Cascade, Cheer, Dash, Dawn, Deft, Era, Gain, and Tide, those are all different detergents for either dishes or clothes. Keep in mind, we don't have anything named Procter & Gamble here. That's We don't have a Procter & Gamble bold, we have bold. Um, but the depth here and then the different products that are offered within here suggests an illusion, an, an illusion to the product line. Now, as we add and drop and we think about the different product line strategies we can have, there's got to be five or six here we think about. One is the full line product strategy. A full line product strategy is when a company has many, many different products within the same brand and category such that a market is very well satisfied with lots of different product options. So a full line would be a, lots of different products being available to a, a specific market. A limited line would be one where we only offer a couple versions of our product. Um, and this is important that um, we think about like when we're first launching a product. If you're very first launching a product, we often only have like one or two versions of it. Um, until the product takes off and our volume increases and so forth. Um, so the limited line is the opposite of a full line approach. The line stretch is when we add a product that's either more expensive and better performing or less expensive and lesser performing. So earlier on when we were talking about Intel and we looked specifically at the Celeron product, that would be a downward stretch because that's a product that is less uh, pricey, less performing than their other products, but it stretches their product line downward um, in terms of 
market that they're trying to reach. When they la when they later on offered um, the itanium processor, remember the itanium was a very expensive processor and it was a very high performing one. That was an upward stretch that they engaged in when they did that. So we have upward and downward line stretches. We also have a filling out strategy. The filling out strategy is when we go from a limited line to a full line. So we have a few products in the offering mix, and then we fill out the product line by, by and we, we, we create a full line by filling it out and adding products that our market would want. So um, here's, here's a kind of a, a little illustration where we have um, different products offered by Toyota. Um, ranging in performance level from low to high, and as one would imagine, as performance goes up, price goes up as well, because you'd expect to pay more for products that perform better. Now, this would appear to be a full line. There's a lot of different product offerings. Um, if there were only a handful of product offerings, um, if they only offered like two or three or four cars, that would be a limited line. And then if over time they added products, that would be a filling in strategy, which would eventually yield the full line strategy that we have here. Here's another example with Anheuser-Busch. Again, um, we have product performance. This would be um, maybe quality um, or effectiveness of some type. Um, and then we have price. So again, we have this upward uh, relationship, which of course we would expect. Um, now what they have done is they look for um, different specialty type products. The specialty type products would be filling in strat it would be using a filling in strategy to reach markets that aren't very well, um, like niche markets that aren't very well um, uh, satisfied with just a generic product. And so when we think about adding the products in, an, in a filling in strategy, what we're really doing is we're trying to reach lost customers or niche customers that we think we can, um, that we think would be profitable for us. Um, another strategy or another concept here um, that, that's included, as we, we, I alluded to earlier, would be this idea of a product platform or platform planning. Um, so sometimes when companies build a, a product, they want to be able to extend that product. And this is really kind of an extension or a filling in notion that when, when I build one product, I want to be able to interchange parts so that using the same basic framework, I can interchange parts and I can literally create hundreds of different products by only changing one or two pieces at a time. So that's what a product platform is really all about. You want to create a family of products um, that you can use the framework for over and over and over again. Um, and uh, it's a very cost effective way to create lots of new products. So the car industry does this, certainly Black & Decker does this plenty of times when they have a motor, the same motor that goes into like 20 different products can be created and they just slip it into each new product that they build, power tools and, and household devices and so forth. But the, the, the actual motor though within the device is probably the same across just about all of them. As an illustration, you can see that this one deals with um, creating a, um, a recording device um, where you have different functions. So you have a recording system, then you have the disk drive, then you have an output, and then you have the power source. And then these four um, functions integrate with each other. Um, so they have to go together. They have to um, they have to they have to be able to work together, um, and then and then they're laid out in a in a production sense. And the notion is, if I have another product that's not a recording device but does require a power source, then I could use the production that's done here, and I can put it into this alternate product 
so I can create um, scale of production after I create, you know, this, this second product, I'm like essentially doubling or tripling or whatnot, the number of power source pieces I'm creating. Um, and so again, it's the interconnected interconnectedness of these functions, um, if that's possible, and if I can create uh, these functions so that they could be used across multiple products, then I've got a product platform, and that's a good thing. Um, what last strategy, product line strategy, deals with deleting products? So it's certainly the case where sometimes you want to thin your product uh, array, and so you drop products that are unprofitable or ones that you are taking too many of your resources or whatnot. So again, if you're going to go from a full line back down to a limited line, you delete products or you contract. So that would be uh, one more strategy to think about as we're looking at product lines. Other concepts that we think about deal with um, complementary and cannibalistic types of products. Um, so when we look at complementary products, we're looking at products um, that are typically sold together. So sometimes we'll see this within a product line where we have two products that would naturally be sold together. Um, that makes sense. Um, that we do that. Other times we look to delete a product and when we look to delete a product, we're looking to replace it with something. So we might purposefully cannibalize a product with a new one that we're launching or um, we may do this by accident or we may do it um, strategically uh, when, when two market segments overlap each other a little bit. Um, that sometimes causes a cannibalization issue. So with product line um, complements, we have here an example where we have Downy. We have Downy Ultra, which is a fabric softener, a liquid fabric softener. But then we have the Downy Ball, which you can purchase, which you would pour the, Downy, the Ultra Downy in. Um, so we have a product that uses the other. And so you would naturally buy these two things together, and that would make that would make sense. You could also go across product categories here as well. You could buy the detergent, which is Tide, but then you could buy the fabric softener, which is Ultra Downy. So we have two different strategic business units in the sense that we have two different brands but they're sharing sales with each other. They're, they're, so sales for these two products would be positively correlated. If you were to look at when these products are purchased, you'll see a, a, a positive correlation between these two things. It might not be a super strong correlation, but they'll be positively correlated. Alternatively, if you have a cannibal, here we have ERA, and we have Tide. Again, these are two detergents owned by Procter & Gamble, by the way, but they compete with each other in the sense that you have um, ERA. This is high, the, the high um, capacity type, type of washer. Then we have Tide. And a person's typically not going to buy both. They're going to buy one or the other. Now, it's assumed that the ERA market segment is different from the Tide market segment, that the era, typical era buyer, if we looked at their customer profile, it would be different than the typical Tide buyer or their customer profile. Where we come into problems is when there's too much overlap or they're too closely associated with each other. So if the Tide buyer and the era buyer are, are oftentimes the same person, then you have cannibalization issues, and that's where we have problems that happen. So that's one way to think about that. And again, when we're dealing with cannibalization, we look at the purchase of these two, and they'd be negatively correlated if if if, if we looked at that. I mean, or not even not even correlated in that sense, because when you purchase one, you don't purchase the other. So that would be a little awkward to be able to figure out. Um, the very last thing that I want to mention here um, deals with this idea of building complements together. And it's really a last product strategy that we can look at uh, that's just simply bundling, a bundling strategy where we take uh, generally complementary products um, and put them together 
um, so that the customer buys two or uh, products at one time. You can charge a price premium for a bundling, or you can do it in a promotional activity as well. Remember, when we do a promotional activity, we're losing margin because we're giving product away, basically. But we should also be realizing increased sales. So, um, so that was increased sales, depending on the elasticity of the product, um, may overcome or overcompensate or for a lost margin. But generally, what we want to do is put two products that go together um, because it makes uh, added value for the customer. It makes it easier for them to purchase because they spend less time shopping, and uh, it introduces a product to them that they might not otherwise see. So it's a benefit from a new product launch type perspective. Um, it also, though, increases sales for the product that you're adding. Um, so if you have one product that sells well, if you have a second product that doesn't sell so well, um, by bundling it, this boosts sales for that product that you get have less volume for. Um, finally, when we do this, um, one of the other attractive notions is that you have two different products. Each product typically has a different margin associated with it. Um, so when we put the two products together, we actually average their margin together as well. So that's another perspective when we think about the strategy behind bundling products. You might pair a low margin product with a high margin product, um, and that would make sense. So at, at McDonald's, you buy a meal, which consists of a burger, um, a Coke, and French fries. The Coke has extremely high margin associated with it, extremely high margin. Um, the burger has much less margin associated with it, and the French fries are, are good, a good high margin product, but somewhere in between. Um, so what you end up doing is you're selling one meal, but you're, sell, you're averaging three different margins together to be able to make that meal work. Um, so so if, if, if you have... Um, if you have somebody buy um, only hamburgers, then y y you might not make as much money as if they bought a hamburger and a Coke together because of that, that very, very, very high margin that you're receiving from that Coke sale. So again, that's another way that we can look at um, the, the justification for putting complementary products together in a bundle. Okay, so this session um, talked a lot about different product strategies when it comes to our product array, uh, dealing specifically with mix issues and line issues um, in how you um, create products, launch products, and how products work together.